So if you have questions, write them down, and then um, we'll take them near the end of the hour, Lord willing. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter's writing, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, But the end of all things is at hand. It's interesting that he believed that 2,000 years ago. I think that's a good thing for you to believe, even, even though 2,000 years has passed. These are not the end times. These are the last of the end times. These are the last of the last days. And uh, so he said, um, we should be serious and watchful in prayers. And above all, things have a fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. So we need that to be able to relate to each other. People will do things that are offensive and, and love, love covers. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Verse 10 is the verse I want you to focus on. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him do it as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory in the dominion forever and ever. Amen? So he says we're stewards of the manifold grace of God, and it shows up in the way we speak, the way we serve, and hospitality. It shows up in uh, lots of different ways. Uh, a steward is kind of like our, our church treasurer. The money comes to her, that every, all the offerings come to her every week, but it's not her money. She manages it, she puts it in the bank, she writes checks. She's a steward of that money. In the same way, we've all been given grace. Some of, a, some of the grace that you have, you were born with. It didn't come from you. Your parents loved art and music. Uh, they had um, an intellectual capacity that was passed on to you that makes you uh, able to learn and uh, study read lots of different graces are are passed on and it's not yours and on the day of judgment when you stand before the lord he'll ask you to give an account as a steward and there's different times in the bible where stewards were called in and they had to give an account to explain where things were and how things were used Jesus told a parable of a day of reckoning where uh, the stewards were called in and said, okay, I gave you grace. I gave you so many mina or so many talents. What did you do with it? And, and as sure as I'm alive, that will happen to you. You will stand about 18 inches in front of Jesus and he'll ask you about the grace that was given to you. Some of it, some of it came in the form of gifts of the Spirit. Some of it came after you became a young adult. You started cultivating grace. If you see uh, Dallas this morning picking away at his guitar. Uh, Nacho was out on the piano with his friend. And, and that's, that's a cultivation. You get around somebody else who loves piano and then you go to another level. And, and uh, there's grace that can grow. Most of the grace that I've received uh, really came through other people. I, I was pretty vanilla when I was young. I, my, my family, I had brothers who could sing and play guitar and uh, brothers who were mechanical, could fix things. They could break things and fix things. I could break things, but that's as far as I'd get. Uh, they had abilities. I, didn't, I couldn't think of any ability I had until I met the Lord, uh, and, and when I met the Lord, all of a sudden grace was released within me, and I was able to start to 
draw and paint and do things that that's completely surprised me because I, I really didn't see that I had any abilities at all. And um, so grace comes in different ways. Since then, God's layered my life with lots of different grace. And the word manifold, notice the verse 10, it says, and each one has received a gift or grace as they've received it, minister it to one another. It's not for you, it's, it's for others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And that word manifold shows up a couple times in the New Testament. Uh, Paul used it in Ephesians chapter 3.10 when he talked about the manifold wisdom of God. It, it's, um, manifold means many dimensional. It's multidimensional. Very few things in God. I, I can't really think of anything, but there might be something. So. Very few things are one-dimensional in God. Everything he does is over-the-top amazing. And it's kind of like many-sided. And each side, as you turn it, there's a different facet. You see something different about it. And grace is just that way. And if you ask somebody, what, what, is, what does grace mean? They'll say, oh, it means unmerited favor. Well, that's... That's one side of it. That's one dimension. But there's a lot more to grace than just favor. It's, it's manifold, many-sided. Uh, I don't know where I learned this now. I, I can't say that I caught it. Maybe it was in, in some footnote, in some Bible. I, I can't recall, but, but I, I, I saw the word manifold and it was many-hued. And if you think of colors, uh, if you have four primary colors and you add black and white, the number of colors that you can make, the number of hues, by just overlapping, just blending, take two colors and you overlap them, you get another color. Blue and yellow make green. And you can get brown with, with blue and red. And you get, you, there's so many different ways to, to get not just brown, but shades of brown or hues of brown. Uh, I remember when I first got a, a computer, uh, it was a monochrome screen. A goldenrod monochrome, one color. And all of a sudden they started bringing out different colors. And there was a race to get as many colors, you know, to sell more computers. And, and that someone could sell a computer and it would say, you know, it has 365 million bits, you know, range of color. Uh, it's just endless. Just working with primary, four primary colors. Grace is just that way as well. Uh, grace is very much like colors. You, uh, several of you could have the same grace, the same gift, say the, the gift of prophecy, but because it's blended with your personality and it's blended with other things you've experienced and other graces that you have, maybe a musical grace, it may come out with the song of the Lord, where the other person, it doesn't come out that way. It comes out in writing. And so it, it's funny how you can take grace like prophecy and just with the number of students at this table, it could all look different in everyone's life because it's many-hued. It's the many-hued grace of God. One of the best examples of, of something that is multicolored in the Bible that represents grace is a tunic that Joseph's father made for him. And uh, if you want to go to Genesis chapter 37, it's a powerful story of Jacob, who's now Israel, and he's, um, he's become a different man. He had, uh, I think, 10 sons while he was Jacob, and then he had a heart change. God touched him, and... Um, when God changes your name, he often changes your heart. It represents a change of heart. 
So then he had these two young sons, Benjamin and, and Joseph, and he was a different dad. And it kind of made the other ones mad. He wasn't like that when I was a boy. He didn't spoil me. He, was, he made me hard, work hard. Heidi's laughing. Uh, most of us have experienced that. My kids have complained too. The younger ones got off a lot easier. He wrote, Jacob had a change of heart. He became Israel. And um, he loved Joseph. And he made him a coat of many colors. And it really represents the father giving his son grace. And Joseph had grace that none of the other brothers ever experienced. In the natural, in the spirit, and on his back. And he, he was given favor. It was, like, it was like he was all of a sudden a firstborn. He was like an only, an only child. Meanwhile, there's these other brothers. And I'll tell you, it, it, it really ticked them off. They were upset, envious, angry. And Joseph, he wore that coat like grace, like it was a gift. He didn't have to do anything to get it. And his brothers said, let's kill that guy. And one of the ways that the, the, the coat represents something spiritually is Joseph started having dreams and he had dreams of greatness that he was going to be great someday and I don't think he was boasting I think he was amazed I think he was surprised uh, I've heard sermons where they said you know he was arrogant and that's what made his brothers angry I don't think so and I don't think so not only because of my experience but uh, Joseph is an example of Jesus, and Jesus had brothers. He had at least seven brothers and sisters from Mary and Joseph, and, and you can read their names. It says, it says sister, so we know there's at least two. There could have been more, and it says that they didn't believe in him. That's putting it mildly. I mean, they did not like him. Can you imagine living with Jesus, and, and he makes his bed perfectly, and you don't, and He's Johnny on the spot. He's always on time. You're not. Every, he just makes you look bad because everything he does works and is gracious and your fallen nature is going off in the one direction and he doesn't have a fallen nature. And so it just you're guilty. You're guilty no matter what you do. You're, you're, you're at fault no matter what you do. And it, they, there's animosity between Jesus and his siblings. And he's the oldest, and Joseph died somewhere between the time Jesus was 12 years old and the time he was 30 years old, and he became the head of the house. We know that because on the cross he gave, he gave Mary to John, the disciple. He didn't give Mary to one of the brothers. He gave Mary to a believer. The other brothers weren't believers at that point in time. Shortly after the cross, they became believers. He actually went to one of them, James, and manifested himself to him as the living Christ. That must have been an amazing moment. James, Jude, the one who wrote the book of Jude, is a brother of Jesus. Uh, James is a brother of Jesus. He became the head of the church. Uh, he had several, and it lists their names here. Some, some of our Catholic friends will say, well, they, weren't, they, can't, they can't imagine Mary enjoying sex or having babies after Jesus because she's immaculate and she's the queen of heaven and so many things that they would say that they're nephews, nieces and nephews. They don't, they don't see it as actual siblings, but I believe it was siblings. And, but it's interesting that Jesus had a coat of many colors. He had grace for everything. And they hated him for it. Yeah, if you do all these things, go down and show yourself at the temple. Go down and do this downtown if you got all this stuff. If you can do all these miracles, go downtown and do it. Well, the last time Jesus heard that, it was Satan speaking. His brothers are being used by the enemy to speak the will of the enemy. 
I met the Lord as a, as a, a really young boy uh, in a church meeting. And uh, there was an altar call and I responded and Jesus embraced me. From that time on, he was very, very attractive to me, attractive to me, but also grace began to release. And the first thing that I blurted out to my family is that I'd seen myself sitting behind a desk drawing pictures, and I knew that was my job. And then after that, I, I, I knew that I was going to be a minister of some kind. And my brothers were all together, my mom and dad were there, and I don't know what started the conversation, but I, I blurted it out like Joseph, and I said, someday I'm going to sit behind a desk and draw pictures, and I was just excited because I'd seen it, and that's going to be my job. Well, no one in our family did that. It was a blue-collar family. It was, you know, my family was, their factory workers, and, you know, nobody, nobody, had that kind of job and I saw it and and they laughed like that's not gonna happen no one no that doesn't happen in our family kind of laugh they laughed I was so embarrassed that they laughed and then I blurted out the next part almost like kind of like compensating or you know I'm not even sure what what all my thinking was and I said and after that I'm gonna I'm gonna be a minister well that was <laughs> that was impossible I mean just so far I could have said I, I'm gonna be an astronaut I mean that's how crazy it would have seemed and they laughed and laughed so hard and I buried it I never said that again for years I was I was an adult before I run the risk of ever saying that again then I, I, met, I met the Lord in a way back then, but, and I started walking the church, and I, they gave me a Bible with my name on it. I still have that. It's in the library at, at, at the discipleship house. and Put the date in there, so I know how old I was. Pretty, pretty young to be walking the church by myself, but my family didn't do anything to develop that, and, and uh, eventually they started taking us away on trips on Sunday, and so I stopped going to church. And then my life got darker and darker, and I, I, I went away from the Lord. Then when I was 21, he stepped into my now and, and introduced himself to me in a brand new way, in a fresh way. And I could see, I could look back and see his hand on me. I could see his guidance. I could see his provision. I did sit behind the desk. Uh, I became Canada's youngest political cartoonist. I sat behind a desk drawing political cartoons for a newspaper got paid for drawing cartoons. I mean, how amazing is that? I remember walking down a street on a rainy day and there was a newspaper spread out on the sidewalk, soaking wet in the rain. And I went to step over and I looked down and there's one of my cartoons. It was the first time I'd ever seen one published in the newspaper before. It was such a thrill to see, even if it was on the wet sidewalk, it was a thrill to see something you drew in the newspaper. Like, we had kind of elevated the people who did that in our minds, if they were reporters or writers or photographers. And, and so I, I, I started drawing cartoons, and I got picked up by Canada's oldest newspaper, and they hired me and gave me my own office, and I had my own desk and secretary. And I mean, it was just an amazing experience to do that. My brothers were amazed. My mom, my mom was so proud. Uh, customers would come in her shop and she'd have a stack of newspapers on the counter and she'd say, my son did this. And she'd, or right, one time I heard someone told me that they were standing on the street reading the newspaper and she passed by and opened it up, said, my son did this to a complete stranger. I mean, what was embarrassing before now became a kind of a pride, at least my mom, my mom, my brothers didn't say much about it, but I think they were amazed that so many things happened during those early days. But what, uh, then when I met the Lord, I walked away from all of that. I knew that part of my life was finished. It wasn't, I had no more desire to, to do that. And we were all sitting around at my mom and dad's house one time and I'd come up to visit and, um, they said, so are you not going to draw any more cartoons for the newspaper? Are you going to quit that? They knew I'd become a Christian. 
And I said, no, that's, that's over. They said, well, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a minister. And they just both fell off their chair. They said, when you were a little boy, you told us that. And so I still relate to those men. And it's just a funny thing. You know, I, I, I'm the one that does the funerals. And I mean, just not too long ago, they heard me preach. And uh, it's just a different, it's, we're just so different. Our whole lives, our, the arc of our life is just so different. But I, I remember uh, a few years ago, I was visiting my mom before she died, and my older brother was there, and, and he was angry. I could tell he was steaming. And uh, I said, you know, what's, what's wrong? And, and he, said, he said, you've always had favor upon you. And, and I'm, I'm listening, but I'm thinking Joseph. And I, and I said, yeah, it's the favor of God. And he said, it's been, ever since you're a little kid, he said, we'd have company. They'd come to our house with a, a chocolate bar. And rather than breaking it down and passing it around, they'd give the whole thing to you. And it made them angry. Well, I didn't set that up. That was just the favor of the Lord. And, and I know what he's saying. It really did happen that way. There was just a Joseph kind of thing, but it made my brothers hate me made 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 them angry my my younger brother one time I was we were together in a, in a house and I could tell he was really really angry at me in fact we we passed each other in a hallway and he wouldn't even look at me he brushed against me and kept on walking I stopped him I said why why are you so angry he says because I know you I said yeah he says you were retarded I wasn't but I had, I had learning abilities. I couldn't read, I couldn't write. And when God saved me, he removed those blocks in such an amazing way that I could read and write and do all kinds of things. And, and he says, you were retarded. And he says, I know, I know God did a, a miracle in you and it bugs me because now I have to believe in God. Because mm -hmm. it's so obvious that God did it. That's the kind of Joseph thing. And so my point is this, is he, here's a double whammy. This is, this is a really weird trip. You're supposed to press in for grace and there's gifts available, unlimited amount of grace available, unlimited. And you're supposed to press into it and it's kind of like God's made it all available and if you're aggressive and you'll pursue it, you can, you can come into so much more grace than you can possibly imagine. And you would think that if you, say, cultivated and come into a real strong healing gift, that everybody would applaud and they would love you. And just the opposite happens. So often it creates such envy and, and, and such animosity. The very people who you think would love the fact that you have a healing gift would try to bring you down, try to find fault, try to, you know, name anybody that's out there that has a healing gift or a prophetic gift, whether it's Sean Boltz or Betty Hand or anything like that. Look at the enemies that they have and how much they're mocked and how much uh, people really try to bring them down. Well, it really, it really has to do with this manifold grace. They actually tore the tunic off of Joseph. They tore it off. Like they were so angry, they tore it off. And then they dipped it in sheep's blood and lamb's blood and sent it back to dad and said, yeah, your son is dead. The Bible describes Joseph as, as being brilliant. He becomes the second highest person in all the earth. He's... he's just below the king who's the highest king in all the earth, king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt calls him father. And through his grace, through gifts, God promoted him. Gifts opened doors for him. Uh, gifts saved people. It was through his gifts that the nation of 
Egypt was saved and his own family were saved from starvation during a famine because of the grace that was in him. But there, there's uh, some, some interesting things online about, about a rare individual who lived in the time of Egypt uh, who was graced in healing and architecture and uh, he, he was, um, had medical skills. He was uh, uh, just a brilliant person, but he was an Egyptian. And every indication is that it was Joseph that they're writing about. And you can actually read in Egyptian literature about this guy uh, who uh, laid up grain, laid up, and he had a way, he didn't just lay up piles of grain, he had a way so that the fresh, the fresh grain went in on top and the grain that needed to be bagged up would go out through the bottom in this funnel system that still exists. You can actually go to Egypt and see the, the grain storage bins that he created where they'd come and pour in the fresh grain, but they'd be down below bagging the grain that needed to go first. I mean, he, he was amazing. And he's a type of, of Jesus. And you could be amazing. Who knows who is sitting at this table today that might just save the day someday for, for the nation or apply themselves in some way that just really benefits people's lives. There's an unlimited amount of grace. It's called the manifold grace of God. It has many colors, many dimensions, many different aspects to it and it's available. And it's not yours. It, you, there's nothing for you to get proud about because you didn't, you didn't make it happen. It came through your family, through your DNA, through your genes, through your early influences, or it came by the grace of God upon you at some point in time. All you are is a steward of it. And the more you think in terms of steward and think of stewards as being accountable, It'll just help you to, it'll actually free you up to receive more grace because you realize I didn't do anything to get it. They say Elvis Presley was a, uh, became addicted and was a nervous wreck because he didn't know what he had and how he got it and he was afraid of losing it. Well, for me, I know what I have and I know where I got it from. I'm not afraid of losing it because I realize it's grace. I know where it came from. And it just actually frees you up because your personality doesn't get warped by it and your identity doesn't get warped by it because it's just, it's just the grace of God. It's just to glorify God. It's just to serve other people. Joseph had a revelation years later. He said, you know, God sent me ahead of my family. He told his family this. My God sent me ahead of you to be a, to be a savior to bring salvation, to, to spare your lives. That revelation, because he had no idea what hit him, why he was being put in prison, why he was being sold as a slave. Uh, he spent maybe 10 years of his young adult life in prison. He didn't know why any of that happened to him. But somewhere in that prison, the Lord said, this is me. And the reason this has happened to you is I've, I've sent you ahead of there's some hard things coming and you're going to be a savior to your people and you're going to rescue your people. And he got a revelation that just allowed him just to relax. What about you? What do you have in terms of grace? What abilities do you have that came with the package or maybe Maybe you heard someone singing and awakened in you a love and a, an ability to sing that you didn't know you had. Next thing you know, you're, you're singing and you're surprised because it's been awakened inside of you. I remember drawing my first picture and it was I, I'm looking at the crayon because I couldn't believe the it was a, a cat on a playing with a ball of string and. And, he, and it came out of my crayon and I'm looking at it and I can't believe that I drew that. It was like, how did that just happen? I, I've been surprised by grace so many times. But what about you? Can you take a few minutes and just in your notebook, 
write down six, seven, eight, nine abilities that, or 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 a disposition that you're you're inclined towards something. I remember I remember reading uh, uh, a book about Eric Vidal, and he said when I run, he became the fastest man in the world. And he said when I run, I feel the pleasure of God on me. And he said God has made me fast. His sister wanted him to leave running. He was preparing for the Olympics. And she said, you know, come, we need you in the mission work. We need you, in, we need you uh, uh, with the mission that they were doing. And he said, but I can't, I can't leave this. I, I think God has made me fast for a purpose. So running, just in a, in a, a, a physical ability, could actually be the grace of God. And he used that to glorify God in a way that was remarkable. That, that'd be a good book for you to read. It's called Chariots of Fire, Eric Liddell. That's, that's one of my favorite stories. It's just a, a, brilliant, a brilliant story. Everyone should read that story. But it's about grace. So what, what grace do you have? Can you write some out for your, for your eyes only? No one else is going to see it. So be bold, be honest. Take some time right now and just write out what you have. 